So hi, uh, my name is Sandy Chen, and as she said, I'm the co-author of the book, Serious Games, Games That Educate, Train, and Inform. And in that book, we had a chapter on educational games and the climate for educational game developers. And that book was in 2005, and I wanted to find out if the challenges we discussed at that time had been rectified and what was the current situation. Last year, I did an in-depth study of the educational game market on behalf of the Cooney Center here in New York City, and I'd love to share some of the key insights from that research today. So it was really exciting to see the key, it, keynote speeches where they talked about educational VR. That's like the holodeck, that's virtual reality. There's alternate reality games on the phone that blend real world data with narrative fiction. And all of this is, is coming. And it's exciting and it's new. And there are programs like the Google Expeditions Pioneer where we will be able to visit locations, past and present, inside the body, and outside in space. Moreover, increasingly, students are not only computer users, but they are learning how to become makers, actually programming and creating these future apps and programs. Um, so I want you to hold on to that excitement and that enthusiasm and, and all those feelings about the potential of uh, what's going to happen in the future and travel back with me to the 60s and the 70s when all the excitement was about the educational potential of games in the classroom. So Clark Abt, in 1970, he was a designer of computer simulations of uh, the Cold War. But for the educational market, he was talking mainly about tabletop or non-digital games simply because the popular computers at that time were extremely bulky. Uh, there was pretty impractical if you wanted one computer per pupil. And the computer games at that time were more like proof of concepts rather than actual mainstream entertainment. It was his thought that um, there would be this revolution in schools. And as you can see, um, the technical barriers have largely disappeared, as well as the spatial considerations. We can use a laptop, we can use a tablet, and we can certainly use the phone for education. And there are even programmable robots that we can use. Um, but still, when he updated his book in 1984, he observed that the educational game market was still minimal. That revolution had not happened. There had not been much change at all. And even today, we are still waiting. Educational games are not a standard part of the curriculum. Most of the time, they're considered supplemental. Last year, in the Educational Game Developer Survey, 80% of educational game developers believe that games will become a standard part of curriculum. So we remain very optimistic that this promise will be fulfilled. But why hasn't this revolution succeeded? What are the reasons? And it's, it's a very complex issue, and uh, there are many, many reasons. I'm going to go over some of the, the key ones. So although there have been ideas like flipped classrooms, for the most part, schools, the institution of school and public schools, that really hasn't changed enough to embrace the learning potential of games. And instead, game makers have tried to fit into the existing structure. They've accommodated schools with their culture of testing by providing analytics and dashboards. They have to deal with this decentralized system 
whereby there are different standards and different regulations, state by state, district by district, and school by school. It's an extremely long and painful process to sell to schools. Moreover, this tendency to emphasize facts and what's needed for a standardized test, plus the 40-minute classroom duration means that a lot of games do not neatly fit into this framework. On the flip side, on the supply side, there's an oversaturation of products labeled educational. And guess what? A lot of them are free. So everybody loves free stuff. We use free stuff. But if you're a developer, it's not so easy to compete with free stuff and make a living. And certainly a developer can claim, I have a quality product. You should pay for that. But there are major discoverability issues. How can they be found in this market where there is so many products? So quality and not so good quality games, they exist in the same place and maybe at the same price point. Maybe they're free. Maybe they're really low cost. That's a general undervaluation of the market. And consumers become to expect that what we can get is free or generally low cost. And consumers can't uh, really evaluate, this is quality or this is not quality. They're a little bit bewildered, disoriented, and confused. Furthermore, I think that they might think, is this truly educational? Is this an educational product? Is it simply labeled that way? This is a labeling issue, or maybe even a terminology issue. Is this a game? I might not consider this to be a game, somebody might consider it to be a game. In fact, a lot of what is labeled a game would be what people would call chocolate-covered broccoli. <laughs> they are interactive flashcards, interactive worksheets, they are quizzes. They are not what would be considered to be a revolution in, in schooling. And that's unfortunate because generally it is not those drill and practice interactive worksheets that lead to effective learning. In a Harvard study, they found for the multi-user virtual environment, River City, for D students, there was a 370% increase in learning. So obviously these longer form games, they have a hard time fitting into the classroom. And that is a bit of a challenge. But the students who have these uh, games to work with, they are more engaged and they are more invested. If we look at the entertainment sector in general, the same thing is true. The sales are generally for longer form games. Games that you need to spend a lot of time to become good at it or to become better at it. And kids, they do invest the time. They are willing to invest the time so much that, I mean, like was just said in the Minecraft session, they'll watch videos so that they can learn or they can learn to be, have the best strategies. Um, they may idolize some well-known players. They may even do cosplay. They become virtually, they're basically part of the fandom. So my message here is not that we should all go out and play Call of Duty or become blockbuster game developers um, simply because kids spend a lot of time with these games. However, in terms of uh, how kids spend their time, of course, there is a competition between education and entertainment. What we should learn from these games is how do we tap into that motivation? How do we get you know, the same, types, uh, same type of interest? A teenager said to me, 
look, if uh, I could play League of Legends in school, I'll study all day long. So clearly, when we have something like an interactive uh, worksheet, you can clearly see there's an educational component. These types of products are easy to push out. They're, they're less costly to make. However, kids, um, as was mentioned before also in, during this day, they kind of sniff that out. They know that uh, this is your chocolate-covered broccoli. It's strange and it's ironic, but a kid would rather play an entertainment game over an educational game, even if that entertainment game makes them learn astrophysics. So, is there the savage divide between entertainment and education? I don't think that there has to be this dichotomy. In fact, in the survey, a lot of the educational game developers also call themselves entertainment game developers. They felt that their products, the one and the same, was both educational and an entertainment product. And a lot of times they have this dilemma, like should I develop for the schools or should I develop for the consumer market? Am I educational software or am I entertainment? Now think about this, there have been a lot of commercial hits, this is Civilization or Portal 2 and Minecraft that have been repurposed for the classroom. They were not originally intended for the classroom and yet teachers recognize their learning potential. And in all of these games, you need to learn in order to bypass your obstacles and to progress in the game. And as Raf Koster, who is a noted game designer said, fun is just another word for learning. So, the lines are blurring between what is entertainment and what is education. What a game for education can be a game for entertainment and vice versa. After all, the best teachers are entertainers in a way. They spark ideas and they make people passionate about what they're passionate about. So I understand that there are a lot of challenges for game developers who want to be in the educational game space. And I know that we will work hard to try to surmount them. But what I want you to take away from this talk is that we shouldn't lose sight of what was so interesting in the first place about educational games. Back when computers were extremely bulky, why did they find this an exciting and revolutionary concept and allow that revolution in, in schools to happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandy. Does anyone have any questions for Sandy? We actually have uh, probably about five minutes to get some screens, and if not, go ahead. Uh, it's definitely true that a game that has been developed for entertainment can be repurposed for uh, education. They do sometimes need some help. They need lesson plans and, and so forth. However, I think that entertainment game developers, they can very carefully understand that there may be a secondary market for them. Perhaps they can be more careful in their research and make sure that their fact checking is is correct, but in terms of like bypassing the school market, we have seen that if you market for the consumer market and if it's really great for education, teachers will find out about it, and teachers will you know want to use that game because they they see it as having this potential. So if you just market to schools, then people in the consumers side. They won't really see it. So we've seen with games like Plague Inc. that people just 
end up knowing a lot of things and learning because of playing that game.